Hello everyone, I'm Father Columbus Stewart, monk of St. John's Abbey since 1981. I've taught monastic studies over the years. More recently, I'm executive director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, or HEMEL. My job is to give a kind of big picture of where Benedict came from, the rule of Benedict, and what the content of the rule is, both in its original environment and then what it might mean for us today. So first, some dates. The traditional dates for the life of St. Benedict are 480 to 540. Now, this is what the tradition says. We don't have historical documentation to prove this. We don't have a birth certificate. But that's about the right zone, judging from what we can find in the rule. The rule itself, by convention, is part of his later life's work, perhaps written around 535 or so. But the most important point is not so much the dates, it's the context for Benedict's life and the writing of the rule. Because he was doing this at a time of tremendous instability and conflict. Let me give you some examples. The year 476, just before the traditional date of his birth, was the fall of Rome to invaders coming from the north. The people we used to call barbarians and now call Germanic peoples. But this was the end of the Western Empire and the glories of Rome. And so these occupying uh, tribes from the north, controlling Italy for a number of years, until the emperor in Byzantium, Constantinople, the Eastern Roman Empire, decided to recover Italy. And this led to a couple decades of war right around the time Benedict would have been writing his rule. Now, why do I tell you this? Two decades of hard-fought war. And in the middle of all of this, there was Benedict and his monastery trying to build and sustain community in the midst of chaos. That setting makes the rule all the more remarkable, and it may explain why it stuck around forged under difficult circumstances when the stakes were high. It was tested again and again, and it still worked. So what was the secret? The basic secret of the rule of Benedict is its basic principle. And that principle is this. Christ is present throughout the community and in every aspect of its life. Not only in the monastic leader, the abbot or the prioress, but also in the elderly, the ill, the guests, especially the vulnerable ones, pilgrims and the poor. In other words, by the time you get to the end of the rule, you realize, I encounter Christ in every person I meet, and they encounter Christ in me. From this basic principle of the dignity of human life, made in the image and likeness of God, come all of the Benedictine values we cherish here. I want to say a word now about order and structure. So any human community needs organization. It needs a framework or structure of some kind if it's going to function effectively. There's an old joke in the monastic world that if a plane full of Benedictines went down and they swam to a desert island somewhere in the Pacific, the first question would be, okay, what time is evening prayer? So even before the practicalities of food and shelter, thinking about reestablishing the basic elements of monastic life, no matter where you are, under what circumstances. Now, one of the secrets to the way that St. Benedict structured his monastery was to do so in a way that had both hierarchy, a kind of vertical order, and also commonality, a kind of horizontal order. Some people describe this as that vertical axis and horizontal axis. And he was very creative in combining those two directions. First, the vertical or the hierarchical axis or order of the community. Above everything is Christ. And after Christ comes the rule, which is meant to distill the teaching of Christ into a form of life that could be lived in a monastery. Then comes the monastic superior, the abbot, or the prioress, and then the members of the community in the order of their entry into the monastery. Not their age, not their social class, 
not where they went to school, simply the date of their entry into the monastery. Now this vertical axis is about traditional obedience. And this came to Benedict from the desert monasticism of Egypt, from John Cash and the rule of the master, other sources like that, very traditional. Obedience is the path to life. But even in that vertical axis, St. Benedict is showing his creativity. It's not the monastic superior who calls all the shots. It's Christ and the rule, ruling over everything. So the second aspect of Benedictine monastic life is horizontal. The commonality, the relations among the members of a community. And Benedict got this from another type of monasticism, which was really all about forming community. And this shows up in a lot of places in the rule. So, for example, chapter 3 of the Rule of Benedict, which follows the chapter on the abbot, is a chapter about consulting the community whenever anything important is to be done in the monastery. This is a very interesting chapter because it doesn't say, just ask the wise elders what they think, or just ask those who've been around for a long time. He says, no, gather everyone together, no matter what their age or their rank in the community, because the Holy Spirit might reveal to the least expected, the youngest person, what it is the community should do. In other words, it's not a purely human understanding of rank and power. One of the strong themes of the rule is mutual service. So here we see that recognizing Christ in the other and Christ in me playing out in action, serving each other at table, taking care of the sick, taking care of the elderly and the guests. And he says no one is to be excused from this fundamental aspect of the community life. He also talks about the way that a junior should respect a senior. And we're not talking about classes here in the colleges. We're talking about one who is newer in the community, the junior, showing a respect for the one who is more senior in the life of the community, no matter what their age, by acknowledging their monastic experience. And similarly, there is the care of the junior by the senior. In other words, we have a responsibility to nurture and support those who have less experience of the life than we ourselves have. Now, this is all pretty straightforward ways of saying we need some kind of framework to exist, just like any human family needs that. The role of the parents, the role of the children, the way the roles of the children change as they get older and become adults themselves. But the true genius of the rule of Benedict is that at the end of the day, he breaks out of that purely human order. He transcends it. And he writes at the very end of the rule, in chapters which come from his own pen, not quoted from other monastic rules or other writings, he writes of the good zeal of truly mutual obedience. And he says, none should pursue what they think is good for themselves, but rather what is good for another. This turn toward the other person, this turn toward the other who is Christ, and placing that person's needs ahead of my own is the key to the full vision of charity and community that St. Benedict has left us. So how do we take that text written in the 6th century and bring it into the 21st? So I opened by noting how challenging the times in St. Benedict's Day really were. And it got even worse. A few decades after his death, his monastery of Monte Cassino in Italy was sacked and abandoned when war broke out once more. It was 150 years before the monks returned. And that wasn't the last time that would happen. The monastery was destroyed twice afterwards. But the rule had survived, even if its original community had not. And manuscripts of the rule were copied and circulated, finding their way across the Western Christian world. Now, this is a time when there were lots of monastic rules. 
And anybody coming into a monastery and serving as the superiors, the abbot or abbess, prior, prioress, would think, it's time to revise the rule. I'm going to see what's out there, and we'll write a rule for our monastery. So even with all of that competition, the rule of Benedict gradually gained ground against the competing rules because of its balance and its wisdom, the balance and wisdom I was just speaking a little bit about. And so by the ninth century, the rule of Benedict became the official monastic rule of a new Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire in Western Europe. And it's because of that that we're here today in Minnesota, because the rule found its way to Germany, to the monasteries which are behind the foundation of both St. Benedict's Monastery and St. John's Abbey. So what does it mean to follow a sixth century monastic rule in 21st century America, right here in central Minnesota? Well, I think above all, it means to engage deeply with that basic principle of seeing Christ in the other person and learning to see Christ in myself, despite my keen awareness of all of my sins and failures. It means to practice the Benedictine values you hear about in this series. It also means the freedom to modify the practical arrangements outlined in the rule to better suit our current situation. So, for example, the daily schedule in Benedict's time, what time prayers, work, and so on were done, was all governed by the natural rhythm of the seasons. It changed based on the hours of sunshine and darkness throughout the seasons of the year. Well, now we have electricity, so we can have a more uniform schedule. We've also modified the pattern of prayer services to adapt them better to our lives of service and to add a daily celebration of the Eucharist or the Mass, which wasn't typical at the time of Benedict. So now we gather four times a day rather than the eight times a day outlined in the rule. But even St. Benedict himself said that such things could be adapted to local circumstances. The part that doesn't change is the spiritual teaching. Now, like all of you, we Benedictines also have to navigate the opportunities and perils of the digital world. But interestingly, Benedictines have always been early adopters of useful technology. Clocks, so you don't have to stay up all night waiting to ring the bell for prayers. The printing press, why write out that manuscript by hand when you can make 500 copies? And now, digital media. It makes it possible for me to share this little bit of our history and spirituality with all of you. It makes it possible for monasteries to live stream their liturgies and share some of their stories. The key point is that Benedictines are not afraid of the modern world or the times in which we live. This is what God has given us. This is the only world we have. The motto of Monte Cassino, St. Benedict's own monastery that went through all those ups and downs, is the Latin phrase, succisa vereshit, which means cut it down and it still grows. Whatever may happen to a particular monastery, the wisdom of St. Benedict in the rule endures, raising up new monastic communities, inspiring women and men in many walks of life. So I hope you'll explore this video series and let that wisdom speak to you.